This country is like a gigantic booster rocket. Everything is all fired up and ready to go. Let me say, first of all, I'd like to thank the Polish National Foundation for inviting me here today to talk about one of the great, one of the great scientists of our era, and that is Nicholas Copernicus. I think that perhaps a thousand years from now, long after we have forgotten all the names of the kings and queens of old, long after we have forgotten the names of politicians and movie stars, the name of Copernicus will still be with us because he blazed a trail for all of humanity itself. Now let me say that in today's talk, I'm going to talk about something called the Copernican Principle. But now I want to ask a different question. What would have happened if Copernicus had never been born? If Copernicus had never lived, if Copernicus had never initiated this revolution, how much would history have been delayed? Well, first of all, Kepler used the fact that the sun is at the focus of an ellipse to create his three laws of motion. Three laws of motion which fit the data. And then Galileo showed that the phases of Venus correspond to a heliocentric world. If Copernicus were not born, it would mean that Kepler and Galileo, yes, they would have made discoveries, but they would not have put the sun at the focus of an elliptical solar system. I don't know for sure, but I would estimate that history would have been delayed a hundred, maybe two hundred years if it wasn't for Copernicus. But you see, the legend and the legacy of Copernicus extends to today. It's not a theory of 500 years ago. Today, we have a space program. The internet is on in outer space, GPS satellites, the internet, telecommunications, radio, television, all of it transmitted in outer space. And then we had another shock. It was Copernicus who put the sun at the center of the universe. But where is the solar system with regards to the galaxy? It was Edwin Hubble who showed that the Copernican principle applies to the Milky Way galaxies. Look carefully, see that dot in the middle? Poland is right there. That's right, Poland right there in the middle, that little dot. Think about it, 100 billion galaxies, each galaxy with about 100 billion stars. So children ask the question, mommy, daddy, how many stars are there? Well, the answer is we can see up to 100 billion times 100 billion. And now let's apply the Copernican Principle once again. Perhaps there are other universes out there. We live in three dimensions. We can go forward, backward, left, right, up, down. Three directions in space. Einstein introduced the fourth dimension of time. But is that all there is? If you apply the Copernican Principle to the universe, there has to be a multiverse of universes out there. And so we realize that if you apply the Copernican Principle to the universe now, there are other universes. The universe knew we were coming. The universe chose all these laws of physics so that we would be here today to ask these questions. And if the universe were a little bit different, we wouldn't be here to ask those questions. That's the opposite principle. So we have two principles, the Copernican Principle which says that there's nothing special about the Earth or the universe, and the anthropic principle, which says that our universe is so special that it makes possible life itself. That the constants of the universe are fine-tuned like a radio, fine-tuned just to make intelligent life possible. How do we resolve these two? Well, when I was in second grade, when I was about that big years and years ago, my elementary school teacher shocked me one day by giving me a clue to this paradox. She said, God so loved the earth 
that he put the earth just right from the sun. Not too close when the oceans would boil, not too far because the oceans will freeze. But God so loved the earth that he put the earth just right to have liquid oceans and life. Well, today we know there are 4,000 other planets out there. They are too close. They are too far. Probably most of them have no life at all. They are dead planets, meaning that if we live in a multiverse of universe, then they're probably dead universes for the most part. And so there's no contradiction between the anthropic principle and the Copernican principle. All right, once again. Um, First of all, I, I want you to know that I'm really excited to, to be able to, to talk to you here, having uh, the wonderful audience and being able to ask you all those questions. Some of them are not mine. In fact, yeah, I was rather surprised when I visited the radio telescope here, realized that it's a cutting edge radio telescope hooked up to other radio telescopes around the planet Earth to create one giant radio telescope the size of the planet Earth. This would be the biggest instrument of science ever built right here in this town. Are you proud? Because I am. It's totally, it's Pivnita, it's right here, of course. And that, that instrument is used to look for black holes. Not just look for them, but to photograph one. But in the coming years, wait for an announcement right from here showing that we've been able to photograph in radio, photograph the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And that's state of the art. And the radio telescope here is hooked up to this network of radio telescopes that will photograph the first black hole. I'm very pleased to be here and to hear your uh, lecture. Uh, do you think it's possible to explain dark matter with string to, uh, theory? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, every high school textbook is wrong and has to be rewritten now. Every high school science book says the universe is mainly made out of atoms. We now know that's wrong. Atoms are the minority. Atoms make up 4% of the universe, and most of that is hydrogen and helium. We're made out of the higher elements. What percent of the universe do we make? The higher elements make up 0.04% of the universe. We are the oddballs. We're the freaks. Most of the universe is dark matter and dark energy. And dark matter is invisible matter that holds the galaxy together. Without dark matter, the galaxy would fly apart and we'd all freeze to death. We need dark matter. But dark matter is invisible. It's very difficult to test in the laboratory. There is a particle called the photino. It is a supersymmetric partner of the photon, or light. It is invisible. It has mass. It has all the properties of dark matter. And we hope to create it with the Large Hadron Collider or the next generation. Now, dark matter is very strange. If I hold dark matter in my hand, it would drift right through my fingers, go to the floor, go right through the floor, go to the center of the Earth, and keep on going to China. In China, it would reverse direction, come back to the center of the Earth, and wind up here in Poland. And it would go back and forth between China and Poland. Very strange material. Now, if you, there's a Nobel Prize out there for the person who figures out what dark matter really is. If you ever figure out what dark matter is, be sure to tell me first. <laughs> and we'll split the Nobel Prize money together. <laughs>